Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Mysterious Galaxy virtual event. I am Nick, the Director of Events for Mysterious Galaxy and also the Digital Marketer. Today, we have two wonderful authors here for you. One of them is uh, celebrating their book, Birthday and Debut. Uh, so today, we have both Scott Drakeford and L.E. Modisit Jr., or we're going to call him Lee for this one. <laughs> uh, thank you both, gentlemen, for being here. It's good to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. I'm going to go ahead and show off the books. Uh, Scott is here with his debut novel, Rise of the Mages. Uh, Rise of the Mages is his debut fantasy, combining gripping personal vengeance with compelling characters, making for an action-packed first book in a new trilogy. Uh, Lee, of course, has his latest book, Isolate. It's the, Lee is the best-selling author of fantasy series, The Saga of Recluse. I'm probably going to push the name, Corian Chronicles, and the Imager prof Profolio. Uh, this is his new gas lamp political fantasy. If everyone out there hasn't yet purchased the books, what are you waiting for? You can go ahead and hit the link below. Uh, both authors have graciously given us signed book plates. So every order of your book, whether we mail it out to you or you pick it up in store, will come with a signed book plate. And lastly, before I give it off to both authors, um, if you have any questions, it looks like we already have one submitted, go ahead and hit the link below, ask a question, and submit your questions you have for either Lee or Scott. All right, I'm going to disappear for a bit. I'll see you all again for the ask, answer and question section. I'll leave it to both Scott and Lee. See you soon. You want to start or shall I start, Frank? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. If you let me start, I don't know if I'll ever stop. Um, well, all right. Look, I'll just give you a quick opening question here. Yeah. I heard that it took you 10 years to write Rise of the Mages. Is that accurate or is that hype? That is accurate. Um, uh, I mean, certainly not hype. That's not something I would I would make up. I'd, I'd go the opposite way if I were uh, trying to look cool. Um, yeah, I mean, it, a lot of authors write many books before they get published, right? And and uh, move on once they've written a book and realized it isn't publishable or isn't you know up to the standard they want to write. Um, I was a a little more stubborn and kept with this one and rewrote it on my own many times. And then I got an agent and rewrote it with him and and uh, his assistants. And then I started working with uh, our mutual editor, Jen uh, Gunnels at Tor, and you know did a bunch of editing and, and revisions. Uh, and then the pandemic hit and my, you know, our, our planned debut date got pushed back. <laughs> and so while, while, uh, I was writing book two and, and, you know, doing various other things. I, I kept coming back to, to book one that entire time, much to Jen's, uh, chagrin. Uh, I, I kept editing it right up until the, the last second. So yeah, it, it really did take 10 years. Um, I don't anticipate any of my future books taking 10 years, but this one did mostly just for me to, you know, learn how to be the writer I wanted to be. Okay. Uh, we've got very different backgrounds in that sense because I wrote short stories for about seven or eight years, only sold about seven out of a hundred until an editor told me that uh, you really aren't a short story writer. You really ought to go write a novel. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I did, and it was published. Um, and that was... 78 books ago. Uh, and what was that first book? The original title was The Fires of Paratime, and then it was reissued as The Time God. Gotcha. Um, and that, <laughs> that was sort of another interesting thing because I didn't know anybody. I didn't know any agents. I lived in Denver at that time, and Denver some 50 years, well, four, that was almost 50 years ago, um, was not, shall we say, the literary capital of the world. And there weren't conventions and what have you. So I just started submitting stuff first to magazines and then to editors. And I'd pretty much exhausted all the editors in New York 
And then I heard of this new startup outfit or a startup label, really, which was uh, Timescape, um, which was a Simon & Schuster thing. And I sent it in to David Hartwell. And basically, uh, after everybody else had sort of said, this isn't quite ours thing, Jim Bain kept uh, the manuscript for a year and a half telling me he was going to publish it. And he finally rejected it, saying, um, somebody will publish it. It's just not my kind of book. He was right. And uh, David published it. And a year after he published it, or even less than a year, Simon & Schuster folded Timescape. Uh, and I didn't know where I was going to go. But David said, well, my former assistant's over at Avon. Why don't you uh, submit it to him? And I did. And he offered half. He offered me half what I got for the first book, but nobody else was buying it. So um, Avon published that. And right after they published that, he called me up and said, we can't publish your second book. Not really. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we got bought by Hearst and they froze in all submissions for five years. So they gave me back the third book. And then I got a call from David Hartwell, and he was with this little startup outfit that nobody's ever heard of. And he offered me half of what uh, John Douglas had offered me at Avon. And I thought, well, nobody else is buying it. So, yeah, I'll sell it. Well, that little startup outfit, outfit turned out to be Tor. Oh, and wow. I've been with it ever since. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I know you've been with Tor for quite some time. I remember uh reading uh, a printed interview that you did uh with tom doherty um right. but yeah I, I didn't know that that whole story sounds like it wasn't exactly smooth sailing <laughs> i don't think it's smooth sailing for any writer it, the question is yeah. just which bumps you happen to hit uh, yeah you spent all your time smoothing out one novel i wrote a huge number of short stories, almost all of which, thank goodness, are lost, except for the ones that got published. Yeah. But that was, that was only about seven of them. That's funny. Yeah. I, so I, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of uh, many authors, but one of them is uh, Pat Rothfuss. And I heard, uh, and I, ha I had been reading him and actually your Imager series, by the way, uh, right around when I started to, uh, to, really write and decided to write a book. Um, but I heard Pat had entered the Writers of the Future contest with a short story that was just an excerpt of uh, from his his second book, the the Wise Man's Fear. So I thought it was uh, I thought it was going to be clever of me to write the beginning of my book, my first book, as a short story and submit it to writers of the future, which I did, and I was promptly rejected without even a note. Um, but that did go on to become uh, at least the seed for Rise of the Mages. Most of uh, at least that that core story is uh, folded, I guess, within the first 10, 15,000 words of, of Rise of the Mages. OK, you, you come from should we say, an engineering background. Yeah. How far back does the science fiction and fantasy side of it come in? I mean, were you a, a reader really young or? Yeah, did that I mean, so, uh, so my dad, so uh, Daniel Smith, he's the he's the only one who's asked a question so far. And he's a he's a huge fan of yours, by the way, Lee. Uh, so I, I grew up uh, I, I guess probably from age 10, 11 onward reading just whatever he, he brought home, you know, whatever he had. Uh, and it just so happened that he had a lot of your books, um, the recluse series in particular. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, honestly, uh, as far as, you know, science fiction and fantasy influences that were very heavy uh, or, or at least included a lot of, of the details and the day-to-day -day aspects of people involved in, in science and technology, or, or I guess, you know, whatever you want to call it in a, in a fictional world. Um, but it, it was really you. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the, the engineering background is a, 
is a whole other story. You know, my, my mom's a, a math teacher and I have a whole bunch of very smart, um, cousins and, and friends that kind of were on that path of, you know, if you're smart, try to be a doctor or engineer or, uh, what have you. And so I kind of got caught up, caught up in that and tricked into doing a degree in mechanical engineering, but I, I got out of that as quick as I could. I think you were a little bit more successful at that than I was. Um, cause you are almost 10 years younger than I was when I published my first novel. And, um, I had to keep the day job for almost 20 years before I was successful enough with the writing to go full time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to be clear, <laughs> I'm not, a, I'm not a full-time writer because of, uh, the, this book or this book deal by, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it, it just so happens that my wife is very successful. She's a, a data engineer, uh, for a, a tech company. And so I am, you know, at, at the moment I'm, I'm juggling some part-time consulting, uh, you know, business process kind of stuff, um, writing, uh, parenting. Cause we have our, our daughter, uh, doing homeschool right now. We have, we have one child, a daughter. Um, and so, yeah, uh, it, it, it's, it's a lot of things being juggled at once. It's, it's certainly not a clean break from the corporate world and moving straight into, uh, just writing full time. That, that'd be, you know, I, I actually used to think that'd be nice. Um, but I, I, I kind of like the variety, you know, I, I, I kind of see myself keeping some sort of variety, uh, in my life long term. but yeah, moving, moving more toward a full-time writer would be nice someday. We'll see. <laughs> I have a question for you about rise of the mages. Yeah, um, let's hear it. I noticed that it's book one of, if I got it right, the age of ire. Correct. Um, you know, ire means anger. Yeah. Is, is this a, a really angry place? <laughs> yes. Um, and, and that was, you know, not super subtle, but you're actually the first one to ask me that. Um, I tried to name the book simply ire, um, and, and Tor didn't let me get away with that, which I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little uh, surly about you getting a, a one word title. Um, <laughs> but I guess you, you've earned it at this point. Um, but yeah, I mean, so th there were a, a lot of catalysts and, and I think being a younger author, you know, with this being my first book, I'm, I'm probably a little more naive and idealistic about what has influenced this book versus somebody who's written a lot of books like you and, and I'll probably get there. Um, but one of the one of the things that I like about writing and the I liked about the idea of writing is, you know, kind of playing out this this idea of a world in which I, I guess physical feats and um, things of that nature are are more relevant in in terms of. Uh, you know, achieving goals, achieving aims, ambitions, etc. Uh, and my yeah. my main character I had in mind was a, a fairly anger, angry, angry person. So uh, it it kind of just fit. Um, I noticed the still the engineering influence there. I mean, infusory. Yeah. I mean, you basically that's basically take take off, if you will, on electromagnetics. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. It, it's. Uh, it, it's a hundred percent, uh, based on, uh, at least pseudo electromagnetics. Right. Um, and, and the idea that if, you know, there were, were such thing as a, as a soul, it, it might be electromagnetic in nature, uh, and kind of ran with that. Um, and you know, there, there's some extrapolation there as, as we all do, I think as, as genre fiction writers, but. Yeah, that's absolutely the the genesis of it. Well, I mean, I, I have to say that in my ghost books, I did have, if you will, souls as an electromagnetic force or field. Yeah, which books? I'm sorry. The ghost books. Ghost oh, of, of Tangible Ghost, The Ghost of the Revelator, Ghost of the White Knights. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually have not read those, but I, I would not be surprised uh, if there's an overlap in, you know, the catalyst for, for ideas for magic systems and uh, power systems, that kind of thing, technology. Uh, and, and it, you know, it really came about just through pondering uh, that our, you know, uh, our, the organism, our organisms, right, have evolved to use more chemical processes than anything else, at least in, uh, as far as uh, energy production and, and sustenance, et cetera. And electromagnetism within our bodies is, is at least as far as I understand, I'm, I'm not really that great of a scientist, um, is, is limited to, to really the, the central nervous system, right? But, you know, I, I thought, hey, what if, uh, you know, what if we or some version of humans had evolved to also be able to metabolize electromagnetic energy and, and manipulate it somewhat in the same way as, uh, you know, chemical energy and chemical processes that we're very familiar with. Well, I think, I think that's, I don't know of anybody else. And I've read a lot. I mean, I can't say that I've read everything, but I've read a lot and I don't, I have not seen anything similar to your infusory any place really? else. Huh. Um, and there, I mean, you never know. There are so many people writing, but yeah. <laughs> it's, I think it's fairly rare. Um, well, that'd be probably, else. yeah, that'd be probably the, the most uh, original thing about me uh, or about my book, <laughs> but the, uh, you know, you've, you've got to, you've got to admit that you do have a few tropes in there. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but the, the technology or the magic belief beneath it was different. And I mean, there's nothing wrong necessarily with tropes. It's it's what you do with things as opposed to what they are. Absolutely. Um, I mean, that's in isolate, which is, of course, the one that you mentioned. One of the reasons why I wrote that book was because I spent almost 20 years in national politics. Yeah. And one of the things that I have noticed and this is going to cause some people to scream, but I have yet to see a really accurate inside description of how politics really works. Again, I'm not saying there isn't somebody out there who hasn't, who has done it well and accurately because there probably is, but it's rare. Um, and what you see in politics on the tube and in the thrillers is totally unrealistic in terms of the way things work. And I wrote Isolate, the first book especially, from the viewpoint of a staffer who's involved in this and is caught between all of the machinations who really has, in a lot of ways, only power over, only power to protect his boss and not very much power to influence anything else. Yeah. But it's a political system, unlike anything that I know anybody's written anywhere and it's detailed down to the mechanics of how it works. Um, and it's assist, it's got some things that would just drive some readers absolutely nuts because one of the things that I'm postulating in this is what if you had a system where nobody had a majority and it was fixed. So people had to compromise if they wanted anything done. Yep. Um, and the other thing that I've suggested, uh, is that, um, government could get on your back if you state something that's absolutely factually false. Yeah, that'll, that'll, that, 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 um, anyway. That's a, that's actually really really interesting. So I've only I've only just started it. I've only had it at home for uh, I slid it at home for a, a a week or so now, and it's been a very busy week as you can imagine. Um, but I, I've dug into the first few chapters, and I mean it it feels I, I, you know your your writing style. I'm uh, 
uh, uh, is, is very smooth for me, at least very smooth. I, I can drop right into your books and, and, uh, you know, feel right at home there, but I'm excited to hear that because I think that's an angle on politics and on governmental policy that I'm interested in learning about. And I think that says a lot for science fiction and fantasy as a genre, because I'm asked all the time, you know, why, why do you write science fiction? Why do you write fantasy? Why do you read it? Why is it so interesting? Uh, you know, and there's a little bit of a, a stigma associated with the genre, but it really does allow authors and, and therefore readers to approach these difficult subjects and difficult hypotheses, right? Without well, I, maybe, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that's one of the great values of science fiction and fantasy, because when you try, I, well, I'll do this in a, a slightly different way. Some 30 years ago, I wrote a book with Bruce Scott Levinson called The Green Progression. It was okay. the worst selling book that Tor <laughs> has ever published. And people, it got good reviews, but it was the worst selling book that Tor has ever published. And the reason I suspect is it was too close to, shall we say, reality. Yeah. And people get, in terms of politics, people get really uptight if you say something that offends them that's directly and close to them. And this book was just at that time too close. Um, whereas in fantasy and science fiction, you can take a, a, a proposition or an idea, and you can present it in a fantasy setting, and it gives you enough removal, the readers can say, hmm, I wonder if that might work, as opposed to tearing their hair out and saying, no, you idiot, you can't do that, I don't like that. <clears throat> yeah, yep, it, and it and it becomes a little bit of a spin on the Socratic method of, of leading people toward arriving at their own conclusion by presenting them uh, you know, that scenario in a safe space, in a in a space without all the baggage of our reality um, and, and letting them to come to conclusions on their own and maybe apply it on their own. Well, at least that's what I've tried. And so far, the readers seem to like it, although there are a couple of them that have said, nah, I don't know about this. And there are a few others which who say, as almost always, couldn't you pared it down a little? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I yeah. don't write short books. I mean, no. but part of that is because I tend to immerse myself and immerse the reader in the characters' lives. And I spend a lot of time making sure that the details fit. I think yeah. one of the things that always bothers me, well, have you ever read a book? And you get, it looks really interesting. And you get into it. And the more you read, somehow the more disconnected that you get with it. Yeah. And finally, yeah. you just set it aside. I'd submit that one of the reasons why this happens is that the author has become so invested in the plot that they don't realize that the characters, as they de develop them, wouldn't follow the plot. Yeah. Those characters really wouldn't do that. But the author is so bent on the plot that in yep. a sense, he puts the characters in a situation that as they as he's written them to begin with, they couldn't do that. Yep, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I, I won't <laughs> I won't mention any 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 franchises by name because I'll 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 get in trouble, but I have that that Especially same right now. not with the debut novel. Just <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. But I, I have that same frustration with some popular uh, and recent movies um, because and you know TV, whatever visual media, because they're they're that same way, and I I I, I feel like they're chasing the plot without developing the characters without. Uh, really even sometimes they're not even developing the plot and the suspense and reasons for things to go to these magic moments that they, they want to emphasize, right. Um, or, or, the, or these impactful moments. And I, I have to say that is one of the things that I absolutely love about your work. Um, you know, recluse imager, 
uh, I, I don't know actually how you, you pronounce it. Cor uh, Corian? Corian. 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 Yeah, the, the, the Corian books loved those. Uh, but in every instance, you, you're you following a character through not just the events, but through how they're thinking through those events and the, the smaller, uh, you know, details and, and character uh, aspects that go into their decisions. Uh, and I absolutely loved it. Uh, I, I love that about your books. And I've tried as best I can to work that into mine. I, I also tried to, you know, give myself some parameters to make the pacing as fast as I could. So it was a little bit of a challenge, but uh, that's that's one of my prime directives as an author and storyteller is following the characters through the story and having them make choices that make sense within their, you know, within their headspace within who they are, even if it's frustrating, even if it seems like a dumb choice, you know, th think about, think about if you followed anybody, uh, along for a matter of a few weeks, especially if it's in, uh, you know, significantly stressful situations, they're going to make all sorts of dumb decisions. Um, and, and I try to stick to that even when it, you know, it, it might not be ideal from a plot perspective, but consistency well, so and authenticity is, is key. Yeah. Well, also it, <laughs> A dumb decision, again, dumb by what standard? Yeah. Uh, because, okay, you can make a politically astute decision, which is popular, and frankly, screw the country. Or you can try and do something which is going to work technically, and it won't happen because you don't have political support. Which is the dumb one? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. I completely agree. Yeah, and it's 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 very very interesting. And I'm I'm actually curious to go back to something you said. So you you mentioned that you spend a lot of time, you know, in a character's head, and, and I've noticed that in your writing. You know, you you write very close to your characters. Is there anything in particular that helps you? as a writer kind of step into those characters worlds because you also write a pretty broad cast right like you've written a whole bunch of different uh characters with a whole bunch of different backgrounds part of that is because okay we have to go back a little ways <laughs> when i was very very young i wrote poetry i never planned to write science fiction or fantasy. I read it, but I never planned to write it. I was going to be a classical poet. And I knew that no poet had, since Robert Frost has actually made a living off of being a poet. There are a lot of taken academic positions based on their poetry, but the academic salary pays the bills. So I knew if I was going to be a poet, I was going to have to do something else. Yeah. So I yeah. got a double major in political science and economics on the undergraduate level. And I just figured that that's where it was going to be. But a few things happened along the way. Like there was this war in Vietnam. Oh, and um, well, I didn't really want to be a grunt, but I was young, healthy, and in college. And I thought, this is not a good thing to do. So I joined an, the Navy through an obscure program that doesn't exist anymore and got assigned after I graduated from college to amphibious boats, huh. which I hated, absolutely loathed. And so in the middle of, the, of a war, I did the dumbest thing any young, healthy male could do. I decided I was going to fly airplanes. Hmm. That's the only branch, pretty much, unless you're a SEAL, uh, that's pretty much the only branch of the Navy where you get a lot of contact with the possibility of getting killed, at least in a war. Uh, and I ended up being a helicopter search and rescue pilot. Well, then I got out of the Navy after five years and deciding that I was lucky to have survived it and um, became an industrial economist. That is the most boring job you could possibly have unless you are absolutely in love with statistics. 
my, job, my job was to, to forecast the sales patterns of compressed air, filters, regulators, lubricators, and valves for heavy industry. It's boring. I wasn't very good at it because it was so boring. So then I tried to sell real estate and discovered I don't have that kind of personality. I sold one house in a year. At that point, I started writing on the side and discovered that you can't support yourself that way. And then just by happenstance, and I won't go into all the great details of it, I ended up in politics. Hmm. And because I could write, I ended up being involved in umpteen million different areas and specialties. I ended up with a heavy, at the end, a heavy dose of environmentalism, foreign trade, energy politics, etc. And so the, sh the long answer to your very short question is part of the reason why I can do a lot of this is I've been a lot of places along the way. And hobbies and those sort of things help. I wrote woodworking because my father, although he's an attorney, did a lot of woodworking on the side. And I did some. I did enough to know that I would never make it as a woodworker. But I sure learned about a lot about woodworking in the process. And uh, basically, it's experience. And I've been fortunate enough to have a, have a really wide range of experience, which makes it a little easier. Also, unlike you, unlike you, because I didn't write my first novel, uh, I mean, even start it until I was close to 40, I had some 20 years of experience to, to draw on. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes total sense. And I, I think uh, uh, we met, I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I, I kind of want to keep some variety in my life in terms of my own pursuits and, and hobbies and things. And that's one of the reasons why, right? I'm, I'm a big believer in bringing your personal life and personal experience into uh, what you write. And that's, that's awesome. I think we've got some questions here. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yes. I am jumping back in to help with questions, everyone, because we have two wonderful authors and a good amount of wonderful questions going on here. Uh, this first one is from Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. For both authors, was there a character that originally began as a small supporting character, but begged for a bigger role as began writing them? I'm going to go with you first, Scott, because this is your book birthday. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's a little easier because I only have one book to pull from, right? <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, absolutely. So uh, there's a character in Rise of the Mages named Jaina. Um, and and I'd, I'd really almost say she's she became my favorite character to write and my favorite character in the story. Um, I mean, I always knew she was going to be important, but I, I certainly didn't factor in her being a primary character when I first started writing this, but over the course of 10 years and, and like Lee talked about gaining a whole lot more, uh, world experience, uh, and rewriting and rewriting, uh, she became a, a, a more prominent part of this book, but for sure, a more prominent part of my my plans for the the series in the future excellent how about you lee um uh, i've done a lot of that in <laughs> my first recluse book there is a character named justin three books later he's got his whole a whole book for himself in one of the later recluse books um uh, <clears throat> towers of the sunset not towers of the sunset i'm sorry fall of angels there is a character named Saren. And I always thought that there was something to be said for her, but it took me another six or seven books before I gave her her, her entire own book. Now, part of this is with the Reckless books, I'm writing a history of a fictional world. So some people that get mentioned, get mentioned in one book as mythical, you, that you find out that what they were as real people wasn't quite what the myth was. But yeah, I've done that quite a few times. Excellent. I imagine you would have. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, next is the question from Daniel Smith. Uh, what have been some of your greatest influences for writing? Scott, we already know Lee is one of them, but I'm pretty sure you have more. Yeah, I mean, so uh, I'd be uh, remiss if I, I didn't 
fess up to Robert Jordan being one of my very big influences. I, you know, I read and reread the wheel of time, uh, all growing up, but I, I will mention on, uh, on the subject of Lee being an influence. So you, you mentioned, uh, uh, Hours of the Sunset, and I, I'm sorry, I won't remember the titles as well as you, or, or the characters in them. But that that idea of you know a, a space, I, I hope I can spoil it because it's like what 15, 20 years old. Uh, uh, that idea of a you know a spacefaring civilization or or people kind of landing on a planet and and figuring out oh what you know what is this we we all of su- all of a sudden have these these powers here and and uh can do things that didn't seem natural and didn't seem possible before uh heavily influenced um at, at least the the uh the theology i guess of the rise of the mages excellent what about you lee what have been some of your influences Actually, I'd have to say, because I started out, as I mentioned a little while ago, trying to be a classically trained poet, probably some of the influences that, in fact, affected me were people like William Butler Yeats, T.S. Eliot. Um, I mean, I've been a big Yeats fan. I even wrote a short story in a lot of ways based on Yeats, Um, not, not based on him, but taking some of the mythos out of some of what he wrote. Uh, I don't know. Somehow I managed to put together a space pilot in Yates. <laughs> oh, <laughs> very cool. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. Next, we have from Hunter. Uh, some authors will plan and outline everything in a book before putting the pen to paper, and others will start to write and see where it is going. Uh, which do you prefer and why? So I'm guessing that's basically, are you a pantser or a plotter in a pretty much a way? Uh, or a mix of both. How about you, Scott? I'll give a short answer because I want to hear Lee's answer. Uh, I I outline, uh, but then I throw out that outline many, many times during my process and re-outline and then ruin it and then re-outline. I don't outline at all in that sense, except <clears throat> I outline the world, if it's a fantasy, the magic system, the geography, the culture, and I've got a general idea of the main characters and where they're going to end up. And then I got to figure out how to put it all together. <laughs> Sounds like you do a lot of work, at least for the the foundation. And so that's very good. I That's, the, that's simply the way I operate. I mean, I can't even write a single novel well, I can't even write a short story <laughs> without visualizing the background, the culture. I mean, I just wrote a short story for um, an a- anthology, which is going to be a part benefit uh, for animals. And I wrote a short story called The Unexpected Dachshund. <laughs> and in doing so, I ended up inventing an entire world for a 3,000-word short story. I'm not sure this is the best attitude for an author, but that's where my mind comes from. And that's the greatest thing about authors, like one operates differently from another and another, um, and obviously that's how you operate. And it's so cool because, yeah, I, I just can't imagine myself being that super creative, and I'm very jealous for that. I, I mean, I'm amazed that you, <laughs> you you turn out books like you do and, and as quickly as you do and and as polished as they are uh, with that process. But that, I'm knowing your work fairly well. That actually makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much, Hunter, for that. We appreciate that great question. Um, Lee, how was the process of writing a political drama thriller in a sci-fi setting? So it's not the first time you've done it. So I guess... How usually is that for you, especially from a politics background? Um, well, Isolate and the three two books that follow, that's definitely a political novel in the sense of, well, it's a fantasy political novel. The other book I mentioned, which was The Green Pol- Progression, was really a Washington novel. It was called science fiction because it was set in the very near future. And actually, the time period in which it was set has long since passed. 
Um, but Isolate is truly a political novel. And it's set in, I mean, I can't, it took me longer to write Isolate than any book except my, for my first book. Um, oh, wow. And the initial draft was 265,000 words. Um, the final draft was about 250. Um, and my editor, uh, she was accepting, but not totally happy, but she came to the conclusion there was nothing else that could be cut out of it. Um, because it's, it is a detailed world and you can't pull out that many of the pieces before the thing just, before the reader don't know what's happening. Um, and I really had to invent the entire political system that I was using, I had to invent the entire culture, and I had to make sure all the pieces fit together. It was brutal. <laughs> oh, I imagine. It sounds like it. And I couldn't help but notice, Scott, you just like, ooh, a little slide right there when you mentioned 250,000 words. <laughs> Well, so as I mentioned, we share an editor and, Jen, you know, when I talk to Jen, our editor, uh, I get a lot of comparisons to Lee, like, oh, this is a big <laughs> manuscript, not quite a, a Lee-sized manuscript, but almost. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And it's a little unfair, too, because, Lee, obviously, you've been writing for a good while. You have so many novels under your belt. And so that's like the younger... Uh, the younger child being compared to like the established older uh, sibling, <laughs> but mom. Well, yeah. I suspect I suspect Scott's pacing is a little faster than mine. We'll see, but I suspect so. <laughs> yeah, and, right. well, I mean, it, it depends on on which of your books, right? I I think I think you've got. Well, that's a... that's true, but. All right. And how about Scott? Can you talk about how different your first draft 10 years prior is compared to the finished novel? I imagine it went through quite a bit of changes. Uh, what I guess have been some of the biggest changes that we didn't see? <laughs> oh, <laughs> God. Um, I mean, uh, it, there's, there's so many, like, I mean, the, the biggest example is, at one point, I, I realized that the entire middle of my novel, which, and, and when I say middle, I mean like the middle 80% or so, uh, or, or maybe middle 70%, 60, uh, just wasn't working and, and wasn't enough because I had done a little too much pantsing for me um, and, and not enough outlining, you know, for my process because, uh, you know, call it what you want. And I'm not smart enough to, to wind my way naturally through a, an entire uh, you know, meaningful plot like, like Lee is, I'm still just astounded, Lee, that you, you have the complexity of story you do fully, uh, you know, uh, fully pantsed as it were. You um, don't know how many semi drafts went into it. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. But yeah, I, I, I mean, the, the entire, the entire middle 60 plus percent was completely replaced, um, at least once. Um, as I, as I wrote my first several drafts on my own, I kept a separate document of all the things that I was changing as I went, that I'd have to go back and, and completely rewrite or revise. And I mean, just, it, it was a learning process, right? And, and it was, uh, a, a project that I just kept at for a long, long time. Now, have there, uh, was there any a bit of that removed uh, content that you actually like, you know what, this might actually be good for one of the other sequels or for a different project and you just tucked away for later? I've, <laughs> I've written a few um, side POVs. Uh, I can't remember what uh, Sanderson calls them when he writes them, interludes maybe, something like that, where it's just a, you know, it's a completely separate POV away from the story, but to kind of give you some some idea of a different part of the world that might come into play later, that kind of thing. I've written a few of those, and I and and Jen has told me in no uncertain terms that I uh, was to cut those out, and I'm still saving several of those and have tried to sneak them into book two, and she noticed, uh, but I'm I'm holding out hope for book three that I'll 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 slide <laughs> at least one of those past her. Um, but no, that, you know, the, 
the wholesale chuck out the middle that that's that's gone that's gone and dead no, that doesn't exist <gasps> Well, if one thing that we have learned from you from this event, you are very determined. So I fully believe in you to make it happen as long as it takes. <laughs> I appreciate that. Of course. Uh, next, what research did you both need to do for your respective books? Uh, were there any interesting facts that you wanted to work into the narratives that never made it in? Uh, Scott. Oh, man. Um, I'll try to get the quick answer on this one, too. Uh, but it's really just electromagnetism. Um, and I, I've tried to work a, a lot of tech into the story uh, as much or more than uh, magic. And uh, m all of that is based on, a, you know, an electromagnetism-esque uh, magic and, and power system. So I've had to research things like, you know, how does a radio actually work? Uh, and, a, and a few things like that, just so I'm not getting it completely wrong. It's not that I'm putting the details in the book, but I have to get at least, you know, portions of the details into the book to make it believable. So there's been a lot of research around real world electromagnetism that I didn't get into as a mechanical engineer, but that that's mostly it. Oh, wow. And, that, and I imagine also that would have been a lot to put in the book to like describe, okay, this is how it really works, everyone. Readers, I hope you're interested. <laughs> yeah, yeah, how, how about kind of, yeah. You, oh. you you just kind of put try to put the interesting bits and and leave the the minutia out, right? Totally. I'd agree with all of that. Um, I did have to put one small excerpt read by the main character in to explain. Uh, why there isn't the use of electricity in the world of isolate. Um, but that was more a question of figuring out how to do it because I, I knew the basics of it. One of the things that I do, um, as I've said elsewhere, the mailman does not like our house because um, I'm not a big online reader of things because it wastes time at the computer. I like my research materials in print. And so I take a whole lot of print, call it technical journals of various sorts, archaeology, physics, air and space, um, economics, history. And um, I pretty much research continually, even if I don't know what it's for. I just keep building up my research base and Usually it comes in handy somewhere along the line. Now, have you noticed it get any more difficult to do that style of research in this growing digital age? Um, I've got to be a little bit more persistent. But one of the things I have noticed is it's harder to do serious digital research because everybody's walling up everything behind paywalls. I mean, I used to be able to find stuff on the Internet that's I know is there, but you can't get to it unless you've got a really in-depth library access. So in some ways, a lot of ways, <clears throat> it's more effective to get the print sources right now because people yeah. have gotten really greedy about um, in-depth online information. No, that is true. That is very fair. I want to subscribe to whatever you're getting. Just whatever whatever you buy, I want them to send me a copy. <laughs> um, next, this one is from Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Lee, I'm a big fan of your hard sci-fi. Planning to return to any uh, to return to that anytime soon? Not for the next couple of years. I'm committed. Well, one, the next two... Um, Grand Illusion books are coming out. Uh, Counselor will be out in um, August, and um, Contrarian will be out probably in early 2023, early to mid-2023. And I just turned in another Recluse book, and I'm committed for two books after that. So it'll be after that before I could get back to a hard sci-fi. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's one of the things that we really don't think about is the at least from the readership standpoint, is what authors are like 
contractually obligated to do versus what they really, you know, project wise want to do first? Well, I'm not call it contractually. I'm, I'm a little odd in that respect. I don't take a contract until I finish the first draft of the book. I don't, um, and I won't, and I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to do this. I will not sign a multi-book agreement at this stage in my life. Um, so that relieves some of the pressure, but considering that I'm an ultra type A, not much. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much, Patrick. That sounds that sounds like the way to do it. And just real quick, so this is Lee's uh, latest book, Isolate. And can, I don't know how well you can see that, but each one of those lines, each one of those entries, is a book. People, he <laughs> right now, Isolate's my seventy eighth book, and I've written three after that that are that will be published, and I'm working on one beyond that. Wow. It's absolutely incredible. Wow. <laughs> it's the, the energy to keep going with that. That's wonderful. That's what that's what I have to live up to. That's what our editor is expecting of me. <laughs> that is some big <laughs> shoes to fill. You need to yeah. tell, come on, please. Yeah, but look at it this way. If we're going to do mathematics, you've got 56 years to catch up. <laughs> that's fair. Well, I'll 40, do my math. I, guess, I guess it's 46 years. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that is very fair. Uh, next question from Michelle. And, and um, one other thing. Remember, yes. your, your first book, Scott, was published nine years earlier in your life than it was in mine. My first book didn't come out until I was like 39. I'll do what so. I can to, I'll do what I can to catch up. Um, next, uh, for you both. When you submit your manuscript, how do you decompress writing in such a large world? Uh, Scott. I don't. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's tense all the time. Tense. <laughs> I mean, honestly, though, you know, I've been I, I've kind of trapped myself a little bit in in this world for the last 10 years. And I've so I've got book two written um, and it's in it's in revisions right now. And book three will be next. So. I mean, I, I should probably find a better way to, to decompress after writing in such a large world, but I, I've kind of just resigned myself to living there and that being my, my world now, you know, I, I, I certainly decompress uh, now and then with uh, all the normal things, but I, yeah, I, I'm trapped in that world and I, I'm, I'm happy about it. It's, it's, it's fine, but yeah, not a lot of decompressing. It's like the meme that just, you know, with the room on fire and the dog going, this is fine. <laughs> this, this is fine. <laughs> yeah, that should just be me. <laughs> what about you, Lee? Um, I don't know that I'm compressed all that much. Somehow I seem to be able to uh, sort of shove or compartmentalize is probably a better thing. Um, Reckless is sort of always there, but it's not in the forefront of my mind when I'm working on, say, Grand Illusion. Um, and once I go back to Recluse, I can read through a few things and most of it seems to come back and then we go back to work on that. Very fair. Thank you, Michelle, for that. I have some lightning round questions for you, gentlemen. I hope you're ready for those. Um, so this one, uh, was actually posed uh, not too long ago by our one of our co-owners of the bookstore in another event, and I loved it, so I'm stealing it. I'm sorry, Matt. Um, what one book that you didn't write, so sorry, Lee, you can't use your jar large pool of books, and sorry, Scott, you can't use your so far one book. Um, mm -hmm. Which book that you have not written would you say would describe you if someone read it or so someone asked, like, what book, and you're like, this, this is me. I'll let either one of you, Joe, go first. <laughs> I can't think of one, but the book that strikes my mind is Zelazny's Creatures of Light and Darkness. Okay. Is that, that, a, that, is, <laughs> that is such a hard question. Such a hard question. Um, it is. And, and it's hard to exclude your own because that's that's kind of why we write, or at least part of why I write. Like, right? I mean, 
it, it's a little bit of a channel to be seen and uh, through all the various characters and ideas you're presenting. Um, but I, <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'll, 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 I'll go with, with um, Lord of Chaos in the Wheel of Time series. All right. Um, sort of related, not really related. Desert Island. You were trapped on one. What one book could you survive on reading over and over until you're hopefully eventually rescued? Collected works of William Butler Yeats. <laughs> <laughs> Omnibus isn't fair. <laughs> I mean, you know what? I think that's it's part of the rules. It's it's in printed form, so I'm guessing yeah. it's gonna be it's gonna count. That's I fair. know. I I have it. <laughs> <laughs> he has the yeah. receipts. <laughs> no, I have well, the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to to be completely honest with you, I I <laughs> so somebody in the comments said wrong should have said magic of recluse. Um and and that would that would be a close one. I, I love that book. Um, man, one book. I honestly I could probably survive on a on a desert island without a book. Uh there's enough to do, you know, staying alive. Uh so the the real answer would probably be some sort of uh wilderness survival book. Um but playing along with the question, I'll go with you're uh, you're showing there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I if I had to set a snare right now, I probably couldn't do it. But if you give me a book on it, I can I can figure it out. Um, uh, sticking with with sci-fi and fantasy, that's hard because there's you know most books are 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 series nowadays, um, and even have been for for a very long time. Uh, so I'll go with one of the shorter series, uh, "The Name of the Wind." I'll go with that, and the one that is not complete yet unfortunately <laughs> doesn't bother me yeah i couldn't help but feel like scott when you're describing wilderness stuff uh on desert island i was just getting like visions of gilligan's island and you're making things out of coconuts and like the radio that you're trying to describe and making <laughs> technology wise <laughs> yep i mean i'm i i play at being an outdoorsman every now and then when i go uh hunting with my brothers but uh, yeah, I, I would, I could not be trusted right now to survive in the wild. I did maybe <laughs> survival training and I never want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. A man speaking from experience. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I, we're pretty much out of time. This has been a really good event. Thank you so much, Lee. And thank you so much, Scott. Um, lastly, before we end it, uh, where can people follow you on social media so they can find out more? I'm simple. I don't do most social media, but I have a fairly elaborate website and it's lemodisettejr.com. No punctuation there, just my, my print name, Dot com. I can attest. He does keep a very good blog. I, I haven't been there in some time, but I, I visited it quite a few times in, in my days. Um, I, so I am the at the Drakeford on Twitter. Um, and that is the best place to find me. I do have a website, scottdrakeford.com, uh, where I post a blog every now and then and probably will become more active sooner or later. Uh, but most of the time you'll catch me on Twitter. Wonderful. Great. And don't forget everyone, if you haven't yet gotten the books, you can get your copy of Rise of the Mages and Isolate with Mysterious Galaxy. We have signed book plates from both Lee and Scott to join your orders um, again. And thank you. And for anyone who tuned in late or is finding this after the fact, um, obviously this is replayable through Crowdcast. We're also going to be archiving this on our YouTube channel. Um, and with that said, thank you very much, Scott. Thank you, Lee. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'll see everyone hopefully for our next virtual event. All right. Bye everyone. <laughs>